Uh, hello to everyone that is online. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, you're in for a special treat. Uh, today we're going to have a presentation that talks about or expresses the importance of Blacks in STEM. And so at this time, I'm going to read the introduction of our speaker. Dr. Wendell O'Neill is a board certified clinical chemist who has spent his career in the clinical laboratory business, working in hospitals, commercial laboratories, and a company that makes and supports laboratory equipment. In this consulting practice, the WIS Group, he advises and assists hospital systems and clinical laboratories on strategy, structure, and efficiency. He has been a member of the Clinical Laboratory Management Association and the American Association of Clinical Chemistry and has served both organizations on numerous committees and in executive capacities. As interim CEO of CLMA and a candidate for president of AACC, he has also served on the National Advisory Committee at CDC that developed regulations for the industry. Dr. O'Neill has been an active, has been active in representing the profession of clinical chemistry and community affairs also, serving as a member of a task force on the drunk driving and highway safety for the state of Delaware, and as a member of the board of directors and president of Delaware chapter of the Arthritis Foundation. He was a member of the board of the Charter of Wilmington, a high school emphasizing science and math during an inaugural year in 1996. He served on the board of a community health agency, Inner City Health in Cincinnati, Ohio, and served as special assistant to the provost at Temple University to increase STEM graduates. When not involved in activities related to the clinical laboratory, he pursues his interest in music, photography, and cooking. His musical interests, interests are eclectic, having, having performed solo and ensembles ranging from classical to gospel blues and jazz. His first band was formed while in college. In recent year, years, he and two other non-music professionals formed a group, the Wannabes, that, that played without charge for charitable organizations. On his bucket list, he is a solo show of, of his photography. As expressions of his interest in arts, he has served on the board of Delaware Symphony and Christina Cultural Arts Center and the Cincinnati Opera. In 2014, he was also inducted into the SIU Chemistry Hall of Fame. Put your virtual hands together and also in the room for Dr. Wendell O'Neill. <laughs> Thank you, Jandra. It's wonderful coming to you guys from beautiful Cincinnati, Ohio. And from Cincinnati, I have to say, good day. <laughs> and I'm sure you all will uh, be watching the Super Bowl. But I never forget where I came from either. So I'm a Saluki through and through. <laughs> uh, I can't see all of you, but uh, well, wait a minute, maybe I can. So we'll go ahead and uh, start the, uh, the presentation as soon as I can share the screen here. Okay. Our topic today is Blacks in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, STEM fields. I was quite taken by uh, the comment that Chara made in her promotional materials, that uh, we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. She referred to uh, the gentleman who uh, posted this picture 
It started as a, well, it started, but at one time was a security guard at a hospital and ended up going to medical school. Russell Adet, that's him in the middle there, the big guy. That uh, photograph is uh, very moving uh, and speaks to all of our, as black people, our connections to our predecessors. When we talk about our ancestors, these are my immediate ancestors. Uh, my parents, John and Rosetta O'Neill. Uh, here they are with our oldest daughter, and she was obviously a baby, and that's what she looks like more recently. <laughs> uh, they had their own dreams. <clears throat> My father was the fifth of six boys born to his parents, along with two girls who all lived to be adults. Uh, two other children died of, in childhood. For five years after he finished high school, he continued to, to work and help support his father and his father's family. So, and it was five years before he ever actually uh, was able to go to college at all. So five years after high school, he showed up at Lane College. For, he had enough money for one year. My mother, Rosetta O'Neill, in pursuit of her dreams, was also out of high school for a year, saving up so she could go to college. And after a year, she went to Lane College with $26 that she had saved up and a bushel of canned peaches. <laughs> it so happened that the two of them were there that same one year and met. For the next two years, while they each went back to, uh, to work, they courted by mail. And the next time, they, and uh, got engaged by mail. And the next time they saw each other was when my dad showed up in Tennessee for their wedding on Labor Day weekend in 1939. These are my grandparents, my father's parents. Uh, my grandfather O'Neill also had his own dreams. He was born in Clarksville, Tennessee. And at age 15, with a fifth grade education, uh, left home to make his way in the world. His plan was Start walking, head it north. You see from this map, the uh, approximate route that he took from Clarksville, Tennessee to the very tip of Southern Illinois, Mound City, where, where I grew up. That distance of about 132 miles, uh, according to uh, maps is a uh, one one day 23 hour walk. <laughs> you got to be a, moving at a pretty good pace. I'm sure it took him more than than two days to make that trip. But uh, he got there and uh, spent the rest of his life in Southern Illinois, where he met my grandmother. I remember very very clearly when he got his GED through the mail. He was always taking extension courses or uh, mail courses uh, all through my childhood. We lived next door to them. Uh, so he pursued his dream uh, just as my father and mother did theirs. He lived long enough to see his son achieve some of his his own dreams for his son, become a respected teacher and married well to another teacher. Further back, my mother uh, became very involved in, uh, in family history. 
as far as she was able to go back on her mother's side was to these two people, Cheney Moore, who was born in 1800, and Agnes Strayhorn. Cheney had a son, Agnes had a daughter who married, and that couple became the uh, beginning of the lineage that we trace. Now, my parents and my grandparents and Cheney and Agnes and all of our ancestors in between, each had their dreams. We are the embodiment of their dreams as we pursue ours. So uh, my story, favorite topic, talking about myself. <laughs> my uh, first 10 years of school were at Lovejoy in Mound City, the same school that my father went to and later taught at, and where my grandmother uh, spent some of her uh, school years. Following sophomore year, I, we moved to Carbondale and I graduated from Maddox High School there in Carbondale. 1960 came to SIU, spent five years starting as music major, then to zoology. That was before zoology got split into all of the uh, various subcategories that now exist. Uh, and finished as a chemistry pre-med major. During that time, I was president of the Freshman Honor Society, Phi Eta Sigma, and also president of the uh, Student American Chemical Society chapter, which was called Chemeca. Served on the student council for a year as representing the out in town uh, student contingent. And also in 62, 63 was a candidate for student body president, which I did not win. Um, as I was about to graduate at the end of my fifth year, I sat with my chemistry department advisor and he said to me, I don't think you're graduate school material why don't you get a job in sales and you can just make a lot of money and you'll be fine. I uh, took that advice. Uh, I, uh, as, it, as it said in political cir uh, circles, uh, I take your comments. <laughs> so, yeah, I hear you. So uh, I decided to having decided not to go to medical school. And uh, I decided then that I would just get a job in chemistry and do that for a while until I figure out what I was gonna do. So I went to the American Chemical Society meeting in Detroit and was interviewing. And there I met uh, a gentleman, Dr. William Mason from the University of Rochester, who in Rochester, New York who said, and he and I laughed about this exchange for many years. He said verbatim, I'm looking for a supervisor for my clinical chemistry laboratory. My response verbatim was, what is clinical chemistry? That was the beginning of our conversation in April. The end of May, I was in his lab as a graduate student at the University of Rochester. Finished that master's program uh, and at the end of that, uh, uh, had a discussion with him and with our department chair about, uh, did I want to stay on for a PhD? Having spent five years as an undergrad, four years in a uh, master's program, I said, uh, in the cleaned up version, no thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, I just needed to take a break. So, uh, through some connections, uh, ended up at the hospital at the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in their clinical laboratory. After a couple of years there, it became clear that to move ahead and 
uh, achieve my full potential in the, in the industry, I was going to have to go for a PhD. So I went to Loyola Chicago and finished the PhD there. Worked on a community hospital in Connecticut for a few years. Went to DuPont Diagnostics. And you can read the rest of the, rest of the uh, activities. Uh, in 1995, I left Smith Klein Beecham and started a consulting practice. That's what I've been doing ever since. As you can tell, my career was based largely on uh, ignorance and happenstance. Uh, fortunately, it turned out well for me, but those of you who are students today have the opportunity to be much more knowledgeable and purposeful and intentional as you about choosing your careers. Let's talk some about what are some of the considerations in choosing a major. Who are you? And this is one of the most important things uh, to be clear about. What do you like to do? Are you a gregarious, outgoing person who likes to interact with a lot of people and get and gets your energy from personal from interacting with other people? Or are you a person who uh, prefers to be on your own and uh, do things without interacting with other people? Do you like to dig into details, or do you like to deal in generalities? Uh, are you a creative who, uh, who likes to think broadly and uh, engage in uh, very creative endeavors? Or are you somebody who's much more application focused? Uh, In engineering, for example, uh, if you look at a, a dishwasher, engineers are involved in uh, refining and uh, improving on dishwashers so that you can have it quieter, faster, cheaper, whatever. On the other hand, there are also engineers who are involved in developing the Webb telescope. Uh, which as you've heard is going to be looking deep into the universe uh, all the way with information that goes back to the, uh, to the founding of, of the universe. Whatever you, uh, and what are the ways that you might go about uh, defining your personality profile? The, the big point I want to make to you, one of them is Whatever your preferences are in terms of your personality, you can find a place in STEM, in the STEM fields to reach those. And whatever area you go into, I would advise you, whether it's a STEM major or any other one, certainly reach out to faculty people uh, to uh, to help you along the way. As undergraduates, uh, they will be uh, very helpful to you in understanding what you're dealing with and getting you on the right path. And as a graduate student, your life is absolutely in their hands. <laughs> so how do you have the most impact? Uh, Shakespeare, I think, said it. And uh, says comments to his son as his son was about to leave. To thine own self be true. And as you do that, choose your battles carefully. As you go through life, on any given day, at any given stage, you can find things to fight over that are worthwhile. But uh, you can't fight every fight to good advantage. So choose, your, choose the front you're gonna fight on, what you're gonna to commit to it, and prepare for the fight that you choose. 
seek out allies, collaborate, and use what you learn to achieve your life objectives. Among the uh, considerations is to make STEM work broadly for everybody. Your presence is really needed at the table. Some of the characteristics of, of STEM majors. The basic sciences uh, are heavily focused toward research. In fact, uh, you may find that the default presumption for students in basic sciences is that you'll be moving in toward research. If you choose to do that, uh, there are a number of resources that are available to you to support undergraduate research. Some volunteer and a number of them that are paid. Uh, I remember uh, there was a, a, a very meaningful day in my career that uh, in my PhD program, on one occasion, my department chair called me in and he said, Wendell, are you sure you wanna do this? And I go, oh, Okay, what are you about to tell me? <laughs> and he said, if you get a PhD in biochemistry, you're gonna spend most of your life uh, in a lab doing research by yourself. And you don't impress me as the kind of person who would be happy doing that. To which my response was, I have no intention of spending my life in a research lab. Uh, so I had, already been engaged in clinical chemistry in my master's program at the NIH. And I decided that that was where I was going to be. Hold on to that thought later. Uh, that while the, the basic uh, presumption in many of the basic sciences is toward research, there are other options that you can move toward. Uh, other STEM areas are very he heavily practice oriented. What do you do? What do you make? What do you do with the information that you have? Uh, and increasingly, uh, STEM activities are interdisciplinary. So building collaborat collaborative skills, very, very much important, very important. So the uh, while you immerse yourself up to some point in the technical disciplines, always be aware of the need to develop well-rounded people skills as well, because uh, in order to be successful, you will find yourself collaborating with other technical people as well as other people in other fields. And uh, I think it's fair to say that across the STEM uh, disciplines, much of human progress is driven by what's turned out. I talked about uh, a dishwasher. Yeah, you can spend your time uh, improving our dishwasher, make it quieter, quieter. Or you can spend some time uh, engaging in much bigger issues. So do you want to focus on small issues or you want to focus on big issues? Uh, just uh, looking at a, a recent uh, activity, the launching of the Webb telescope, telescope into space. Uh, the Milky Way, which is the galaxy that uh, Earth is part of, is about 100,000 light years across, it's huge. Uh, you all will recall that a light year is the distance the light travels in a year. And there are about 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Well, in the universe, there are billions of galaxies, some smaller, some larger. So you can, you can envision the scope of the challenge of trying to understand universe. So in developing the Webb telescope, which was just recently launched, it's 100 times more powerful than the Hubble, which was launched some oh, 15 or so years ago. 
And this, this was mind blowing to me. It will be able to collect light from the formation of the very first galaxies. And these are galaxies that were formed 13 billion light years away. So for 13 billion years, that light has been traveling toward us. And this telescope will be able to see that light and characterize it. Obviously a, a much bigger challenge, a much broader challenge. So among the considerations for you, I would suggest for you, give some thought. Do you want to do a dishwasher or do you want to do a web teles telescope? But again, a path to match your personality profile can be found in any of, of these fields. Let me give you some examples of uh, career paths that people have taken. I've talked something about, about my background, started out in a technical discipline, uh, worked in a lab, actually doing tests. Clinical chemistry does test on biological materials and feeds that information to clinicians to physicians, to physicians to aid them in their, in their treatment. Um, but I uh, made my decision to move toward the management side. In fact, uh, <laughs> I teased the people in the last lab I worked at that, uh, don't make me come out there and do that test. And then I said, please don't make me come out there because I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I've moved away from that. Um, so management is always an opportunity. Uh, I never miss an opportunity to highlight this lady, Virginia Snap Ingram, an educator, and there she is. She was my high school biology teacher. And uh, education at the time that she was born and came into her adulthood, was one of the few career choices that uh, educated people in scientific disciplines could pursue. Uh, so she did and uh, had a tremendous impact on my life. She's probably one person more responsible than anyone for uh, my being uh, a scientist today. Uh, Dr. Al Robinson, physician uh, in his later years became a pastor in addition to practicing medicine. A friend here in Cincinnati, Ed Rigaud, um, a bachelor's in chemistry from Xavier in New Orleans, master's at the University of Cincinnati, worked at PNG. Uh, those of you who enjoy Pringles, He's the man responsible for Pringles, the development and the marketing of Pringles. Progressed to uh, a business line VP at uh, Procter & Gamble. Went on to be a very instrumental, and, and you can, I won't read this all to you, in the development of the uh, Underground Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati. He is now a co-owner of the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, too bad he didn't get to be the co-owner of the Bengals, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, and is an owner of Innova Premier, which is an auto parts uh, company. Uh, in the last couple of years, he formed Legacy, Legacy Acquisition Corp, Acquisition Corp, a $300 million IPO. Uh, it's listed on the New York Stock Exchange and uh, they've gone into, they've bought into a large auto parts uh, company, Parts ID. Uh, I include this in the uh, uh, in the deck so that you can read it if you so choose at a later date. Ron McNair, Dr. Ron McNair, at age nine, uh, took a stand at his local public library. They didn't want to let him, as a young black kid, check out books. Um, he stood his ground, fought that battle, and won it. Uh, was able to check out his books and that building is now named after him. Undergraduate degree in physics, PhD in physics from MIT, specializing in laser physics. 
musician scheduled to record uh, a sax solo from space for an album that was coming out. And I've included the link to that album for anyone who wants to go hear it. Also a fifth degree black belt in karate and a Q man will make a side fine. He was an astronaut on the Challenger mission and died when that mission uh, failed. Another example, Dr. Kazmikia Corbett, uh, one of the people responsible for the development of the uh, COVID vaccine. Again, I put this here just for your future reference, PhD in, uh, in sciences, immunology. Uh, the vaccine concept that she developed uh, was the basis for the Moderna vaccine, which is shown to be highly effective. Uh, and she has a, a portfolio of, uh, of um, patents that are, have much broader application. So if we talk about people who can have an impact on the world, there's an example. Uh, she invests a lot of her time in underserved communities as an advocate for STEM education and, and vaccine awareness. Uh, here you see her with the president of a tour through her laboratory. And I just want to take one, one brief moment to make my editorial uh, comment about COVID. If you're going to be active in society, there is no such thing as neutral ground with regard to vaccinations. Uh, there are people who believe that by refusing to take the vaccination, they're taking a neutral stance. They're not. There are only two populations in the interactive society, those who are vaccinated and those who are not. And there are a number of ways to measure the impact of that. Um, but uh, the, the critical measurement is who is sick enough to be hospitalized and who dies. And you see the, the difference in likelihood across those two populations. Beyond that, every person who's infected, it's not all about me, it's not all about you, it's about us. Uh, every infected person, whether you get sick or not, or how sick you get, the virus that's in your body is replicating in your body. So your body serves as a breeding ground for new variants to form. And we never know when a new variant uh, is going to pop up. It's going to be uh, extremely more dangerous than the ones that we've seen so far. So <clears throat> by refusing to, to be vaccinated, uh, you're putting us all at risk. So uh, to kind of uh, summarize some of that, at any degree level, uh, there are a number of options uh, for you to uh, pursue. So don't feel like by uh, taking that, uh, a technical degree that you're locked into to any particular thing. Uh, I recall a, a conversation I had with the chairman of my department, in my master's program, a Harvard man, he was a big man, about six foot four, big booming voice. And when he asked me if I was interested in staying on PhD, I said, no, no. One, I need a break. And secondly, uh, if you get a PhD, you're going to be locked into whatever you get your, your PhD research on for the rest of your career. To which he responded in his Harvard accent, booming voice, poppycock. <laughs> uh, and he was right, poppycock. There are, any, there are many, many options. Uh, for you to pursue in your, over the course of your life uh, with a STEM degree. Now, I was asked to, to talk about uh, flying black medics. And I, I, let me warn you, I'm going to go full uh, Rachel Maddow on you right here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, those of you who watched our program, you, you know that she kind of starts out talking about stuff and brings it back together at some point. Well, in 1962, a young woman named Mary Celine McCollum came to SIU. And there's a, a link there that you can pursue. That's Mary. We knew her as Celine. Uh, and you can see her uh, as an active person in the, uh, in the freedom movement. Uh, she oops, uh, came out of Nashville as a freedom rider. And you can see her here with uh, John Lewis and some other people on my birthday, as it turns out, in 1961. She came to SIU taking a, a break from frontline civil rights work. And she called herself going up north to get away from activity. She found that she hadn't gone as far up north as she thought or had hoped <laughs> when she came to Carbondale. So she found that many of the situations that she was working on in the deep south were also present in Southern Illinois. So when she advised some of her coworkers from, from SNCC, Student Avant Coordinating Committee, uh, to start a movement, she did. She gathered several black students, including my brother John and me. And uh, one of the things that you need to do, and, and I want to leave some time for questions here, so I'll, I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, one of the things that she did, uh, asked where would be a good place to focus the movement? And John and I very quickly said, we know a place. Uh, Carol, um, I'll leave this for you to read at your, at your leisure. Uh, so the movement started in Carroll. We went down, uh, John and I and uh, a couple of other people went to Carroll, met with a pastor at Ward Chapel AME Church, Dr. Reverend Blaine Ramsey, who uh, we knew from our childhood. And uh, that was the beginning of the freedom movement in, in Carroll. This is a picture of uh, when things got a little bit, got kind of rough. Uh, she asked John to come and he did. Uh, this was during one of the demonstrations in Carroll. There she is uh, with Chuck Nebbett, who is a, another Carbondale guy. The Carroll movement, uh, was life-changing for a number of people. Chuck was one of them. He spent the rest of his life so far uh, active in SNCC and was one of the founding members of the SNCC Freedom Centers. Uh, my brother, John, who I mentioned, uh, spent the rest of his life act uh, active in the movement as well. Uh, went south with SNCC right out of school and uh, was the founder of the Free Southern Theater which he used as a uh, mechanism for social change. So, uh, when we went to Cairo, met with uh, Reverend Ramsey, got the movement started and recruited a, a high school senior whose name was Charles Cohen. Uh, very bright young man quarterback of the football team, clearly had leadership skills. And we recruited him to lead the youth group. And here's Charlie Cohen, now Reverend Charles Cohen, uh, eight years later in 1970 with uh, the founder of the Flying Black Medics, Dr. Barry, and the, at that time, pastor of War Chapel. Uh, Dr. Leonid Leonidas Berry, uh, again, was the, the founder of the Flying Black Medics. And you can read through that at this at your leisure. Uh, they uh, chartered airplanes, flew down to Carroll, conducted clinics, uh, 
good treatments and, and healthcare education uh, at War Chapel. And in 1970, this is the program for a, a conference that they held at War Chapel. And you can see who some of the people are who were involved. And again, I won't uh, go too deep into this. Uh, this gentleman, Preston Ewing, is still in Carroll, uh, very active as a historian and uh, photographer. Uh, Reverend Ramsey at that time had moved on to uh, other activities. And Charlie Cohen uh, was, was actively involved. So in summary, if you find STEM subjects interesting, uh, and it's important that uh, whatever major you choose, that uh, you find it interesting. And if you have a facility for systematic thinking, because technical areas does require, they do require uh, uh, thinking in a certain pattern. If that's not your natural inclination, as it's, it's not mine, if you've ever done a Mars Briggs personality profile, you don't know about the P and J personalities. A J personality is a person who likes to go step by step, always wants to know what's the plan and follows the plan in a very organized fashion. At the other end of the spectrum is the P personality. If you ask a P personality, uh, like me, off the chart P, if you ask me what's the plan, I'll go, uh, that away, let's go. <laughs> That's my natural inclination. But you can learn to, uh, to, to think through things in a certain way and apply that, even if that's not your natural inclination. So you have to have a facility for that. STEM would be a fulfilling area in which to make your, prog uh, if, you, if you believe, the STEM would be a fulfilling area to make your contributions then you can find a place for STEM that is a fit for your personality type and make a meaningful contribution. So go for it. Uh, the last slide uh, is one that I just took out of the news from my favorite section of the newspaper just last week and I'll let it speak for itself. All right, thank you. And uh, Kara, let me turn it back to you to manage the next piece. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, I will check online to see if you have any questions available. I know one question uh, is, let me share one to see me. One question is for those who are kind of on the fence uh, regarding STEM, what would be your advice to those who are on the fence or who feel discouraged about going into the field because they don't see people that look like them? What would be your advice? All the more reason that you need to be there. Um, you need to be at the table. And uh, my cousin who's online, uh, who runs a uh, woman's engineering program at UCLA, uh, made the point very clearly that for, for decisions that are being made, we need to be at the table when they're done so that our concerns uh, are taken into account. And she gave the example, Audrey, thank you, um, uh, seat belt. Engineers developed and made seat belts. Who do they make them for? They made them for males of a certain size and a certain body structure. Women and children were not part of the consideration. Not out of any malice, it was just that never crossed our mind to think about people other than themselves. So we need to be at the table as black people, as women, uh, to bring different points of view to the table. So 
don't be discouraged by the fact that you don't see other people there. That's the reason you need to be there. Um, from the academic point of view, uh, there's a, a certain amount of uh, natural uh, approach that you need to be able to marshal in order to be successful in, in STEM. Uh, if you have that, then STEM is uh, uh, a good choice for you. And don't be intimidated, by the way. And don't be dis distracted or discouraged. If I had been discouraged by my undergraduate advisor, I don't know what I would have ended up doing. Excellent, excellent. I see a lot of a lot I see a lot of different comments and fun facts. So I always appreciate those things. Um, another question that I, I want to ask is what are some uh, what are some things that students can do to actually help them prepare for STEM? Because um, we may have uh, students that are also you know in high school right now. Mm. and uh, may want to continue on with that even as they go to college. What are some things that they could do uh, to prepare themselves? Uh, learn as much as you can about it, experience as much as you can. Uh, reach out to people who are in, in STEM fields or have come through STEM fields as some of the people that I just pointed out. Uh, I didn't highlight it, but uh, uh, the uh, former chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel, is a physicist by training, his PhD in physics. Uh, so you can you can do anything with uh, with that background. Uh, again, there's a certain. Let me give you an example. Some people can look at something on paper and in their mind's eye, lift it up off the paper and turn it around and look at it from different angles. Now, some people can do that and some can't. It's not an indication of intelligence. It's just, it's no different than how tall are you? It's something either you're born with or you're not. But if you don't have it, there are certain STEM areas that you don't want to go into because it requires that you be able to do that. Um, so give a lot of thought to who you are and how you interact in the world, what skills and proclivities you have, and then look at how you can apply those. Um, and, uh, as a, a singer that I work with likes to say, don't be scared, <laughs> just do it. <laughs> she's a blues singer. She's she's a character. Uh, so yeah, just and uh, by the way, if you're in college already or if you're approaching college, talk to your advice, talk to your faculty people. Uh, get as much information as you can from them. But again, don't don't let naysayers discourage you. You know yourself better than anyone else knows you. So go for it. <laughs> well, okay, one more question. Who is your favorite gospel and blues singer? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife would tell you that I don't have a favorite <laughs> anything. <laughs> she asked me what's my favorite meal. I go, well, that depends. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll list one, Ray Charles. Awesome. Uh, his, his album, The Genius of Ray Charles is well put. A lot of people don't know that he grew up uh, in Florida listening to and, and, and playing country and Western music. Oh, wow. That's what he started with. And uh, you remember uh, he did a whole album of, of country and Western in later years. So yeah, he's he's one. Give me a half hour and I'll tell you a bunch of others. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. O'Neill, for taking the time out and to uh, just educate us and uh, provide advice for students on the importance of STEM. You've provided uh, golden nuggets here. And so uh, thank you once again. And uh, everything you do is just, I mean, as far as the uh, field of science, I mean, it's just so important. And we, you know, that statement where um, the, the quote that says that we are our ancestors' wildest strength. I mean, it's amazing to see the different contributions that we've made to this country as it uh, as it relates to science, technology, mathematics, and so forth. So I just want to thank you for just taking the time out uh, to speak to us today. Amazing job and amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, congratulations to you, Jara, for organizing this month's activities. Uh, from what I've seen, and uh, it's, a, it's an amazing program for the month. Uh, so congratulations you. to you. And I'll also say to uh, any of the uh, attendees who would like to have a deeper discussion, uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. Jara has my contact information. And uh, if you don't have it uh, from, from uh, the information that you already have. All right, we'll do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>